Hello again. Welcome to another video for Astronomy 102. Today's topic is the production of light. Light can be produced in a few different ways, but in this video we will focus on light production via thermal emission. We'll first discuss your results from the experiment you did in last class, also known as the Herschel experiment. During that experiment you obtained a measure of the solar spectrum and also, hopefully, discovered infrared radiation. You found that the solar spectrum peaks somewhere in the visible range of wavelengths. In this class, we're going to discuss the location of that peak and the consequences that has for the evolution of plants and animals on Earth. How is light from the sun generated? We're going to find that hot things produce light, and in order to understand why, we'll have to talk about what temperature and heat mean on a molecular level. Once we understand the source of thermal emission, we will discuss how the wavelength and brightness of that emission varies according to the temperature. We'll end by contrasting these idealized spectra we've been talking about to real astronomical spectra and highlight some differences between the two. Last class, you guys performed the Herschel experiment. In the Herschel experiment, you attempt to measure the amount of light being emitted by the sun at different wavelengths. You do this by placing thermometers under the different colors of light. We used a glass prism to disperse the light from the sun, the white light from the sun, into its separate individual colors. And then we placed thermometers, one thermometer under each color of light. The idea here is that for each thermometer, as it gets struck by light of that particular wavelength, it gets hotter. And as its heat increases, the temperature that you read will increase. So by reading off the temperatures for each thermometer, or the difference in temperatures for each thermometer, you should be able to calculate how much light there is in each color relative to the others. So that's the idea behind the Herschel experiment. You place this thermometer under the blue and green, yellow, and red parts of the spectrum. And you also place a thermometer in the shade just beyond the red that's going to serve as your control thermometer. For the control thermometer, you might expect that the temperature won't change from what it was previously in the shade. I asked you guys to make predictions about how each thermometer was going to change once you put it in the sunlight. And most of you thought that the blue thermometer was going to change the most. I understand that reasoning. You know that the blue wavelengths are more energetic than the red wavelengths, so you might expect that the thermometer being illuminated by blue light might increase the most. When you did the experiment, however, and you noticed and you put the thermometers in sunlight, the temperature in each thermometer increased by different amounts. And in general, for most of your setups, this is more or less what you saw. The red light was the highest in temperature change, followed by the yellow um, green and then the blue. So in fact the red thermometer was hotter than the blue thermometer. And even weirder is that the shade thermometer or the control thermometer was very hot. In general hotter than the yellow green thermometer and always hotter than the blue thermometer. Now this is confusing because you expected it to stay the same. You expected it to be your control thermometer. It was a little bit more obvious when you start thinking about this as the measurement of a spectrum. So this is what the continuous spectrum might look like. It's peaking around the red wavelengths. And so your control thermometer, your shade thermometer, is really not a control thermometer at all. It's just measuring the, wave, the, the amount of light, or the amount of sunlight, at a wavelength that we can't see with our eyes. And we perceive it as shade. We think of it as shade, it looks the same as the other shade, the one that we used in the beginning of the experiment as the sort of baseline measurements, but it's in fact different. In this shade, the shade right next to the red thermometer, there is light hitting the thermometer 
though we can't see. It still looks shady to us, but it is in fact filled with infrared light. That infrared light is just like the visible light being dispersed by the prism, and it's hitting the thermometer that's just to the right of the red thermometer, as you might expect, since you know that infrared light is light that's beyond the red or under the red. So this is how you discovered infrared radiation. This is how Herschel discovered infrared radiation back in the 1700s. Of course, the spectrum of light did not stop at the edge of the visible light, so it did not stop just at the red thermometer, or just beyond the red thermometer. It went through to the infrared. And it also doesn't stop right at the edge of this graph, so it continues in either direction from the on the blue side all the way to the UV and x-rays and gamma rays and on the right side on the red side past the infrared into microwave and radio regimes if you were to take more precise measurements with sort of fancier equipment than our little thermometers then this is what the sun uh, the spectrum of sunlight might look and it again peaks right in the middle of the visible range, of the range of wavelengths that are visible to our human eyes. Now, the fact that that's where the solar emission peaks, and that's in fact where most of the, if you were to count the number of photons coming from the sun, that's where most of them are located, means that we as humans on the surface of the Earth have adapted our eyes, our eyes have evolved, to utilize those photons that exist in bigger quantities. We are diurnal animals, we live, you know, and our waking hours are during sunlight, and we want to use the most sunlight available to do all of our tasks like hunting and eating and working and solving astronomy problem sets. Nocturnal animals, on the other hand, might use different types of wavelengths since at night the sun isn't up. And so pit vipers, for example, will use have infrared detectors instead of eyes or in addition to eyes um, that help them see warm prey in the cold night. Other types of animals have other types of vision. Bees, for example, have uh, ultraviolet vision, which was a real mystery to researchers when they discovered this, because they couldn't figure out why that was evolutionarily advantageous to them. They really, if you remember from our video a few classes ago, the atmosphere blocks a lot of the UV from the sun, so there just isn't much UV around, and you can also see from the solar spectrum here that there just isn't much light emitted in the ultraviolet from the sun. Of course, there is some, we still get sunburned, but it's really not as available as visible light might be. And yet bees' eyes have evolved to detect things in the ultraviolet. And it wasn't until people took pictures of these flowers in the ultraviolet that they understood why bees had the eyes they did. These flowers in the ultraviolet have these spectacular patterns. These patterns reflect UV light, and so when you see them in ultraviolet, they show up. And the patterns are essentially indicating to the bees, you know, here, come here, pollinate me. Pollination is advantageous, it's good for the flowers, because they get to spread their genetic material, and it's good for the bees, because it's food. And so, evolutionarily, these two things evolve together to develop UV emission or reflection and vision. Now, human vision has adapted to the visible part of the spectrum, and color vision is also an evolutionary process, and it's also extremely advantageous to us. This is a picture of a tree in black and white. What we would see if instead of having three cones, one for each region of the spectrum. We only had one that was sensitive to everything and we couldn't discriminate between the wavelengths of light. This is that same tree in full color. And now it becomes apparent that it's filled with ripe fruit for us to eat. So color vision 
is really advantageous to us because it allows us to know when and what to eat, among other things. If we go back to the solar spectrum that you measured during class, you'll see again that it doesn't stop at the infrared or at the UV, but rather goes on beyond the infrared into microwave and radio, and beyond the UV into x-rays and gamma rays. And in fact, the sun emits at all these wavelengths, as you can see here, from the radio all the way to the x-ray. What makes the sun emit light? And why does that light peak in the visible part of the spectrum? Well, as you know, the sun is very hot, very, very hot. And hot things, you already know, emit light. You know this because when you turn on your electric stove, you can see that the filament, which initially was dark, as the heat starts rising, as its temperature rises, starts to glow, first a faint red, faint dark red, and then a bright, bright red. It's emitting light at visible wavelengths when it gets very hot. But why do hot things emit light. In, under, in order to understand why hot things emit light, we need to understand what hot means. What is heat and what is temperature? As physicists, we define temperature as the average speed of molecular motion. If you have a certain material, you have molecules and they move around. And the amount of motion for those molecules, or the average amount by which they move, is considered to be the temperature. So very hot things have very high speeds for their molecular motion, which means that the molecules are just whizzing around really fast. If you turn the temperature down, those speeds go down, and things start moving slower. Temperature is measured in a few different scales. One you might be very familiar with, the Fahrenheit scale. On this scale, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees and the boiling point at 212. There's another scale called the Kelvin scale that we use more frequently in physics. And that's because it has a very fundamental meaning. In the Kelvin scale, the zero point of the scale, or zero Kelvin, corresponds to absolute zero. At absolute zero, things can't get any colder. And if you think back to the idea of temperature corresponding to molecular motion, you'll understand why when I tell you that at absolute zero, there is no motion. Molecules are standing perfectly still. Now, you can't have negative motion. So that's why it's absolute zero. You can't go beyond it. On the Kelvin scale, absolute zero is zero degrees Kelvin. The freezing point of water, 273 degrees. And the boiling point, 373 degrees. On the Fahrenheit scale, absolute zero corresponds to minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very chilly indeed. On the Kelvin scale, a healthy human at 98 degrees Fahrenheit registers 310 Kelvin. The sun, an average star, registers 5,700 degrees Kelvin. Thermal emission occurs because there is a constant interaction between particles and photons. When the temperature goes up, Particles or molecules are moving faster. The photons, as they interact with these more fast-moving molecules, become more energetic. They have shorter, bluer wavelengths. There's also more of them, and the light intensity goes up. In contrast, when the temperature goes down, particles will move slower, and so the photons that are interacting with them will be less energetic and they'll have longer or redder wavelengths. There will also be less of them, so the light intensity goes down. 
It's important to realize that you can only get thermal emission from opaque objects. I just told you that thermal radiation is created by the interaction between photons and matter. If photons go sailing through that matter without interacting with any of their particles, then there's no thermal emission because there's no interaction. So for transparent things that aren't opaque, there can be no thermal emission. For opaque matter, where photons whiz around and collide with a whole bunch of different molecules before they're finally released, then those interactions create the thermal radiation. So when you stick an iron poker in a fire and heat it up, it starts by glowing a deep red, but as its temperature is increased, the red becomes brighter until it looks orange, then yellow, or white hot. The same thing will happen with stars. If we look at Orion again closely, you might notice that Betelgeuse is very red compared to its neighbors. Its temperature is only about 3000 degrees Kelvin, half of what the solar temperature is. So it peaks in the red part of the spectrum. The sun is about twice as hot at 6000 degrees Kelvin, so it peaks closer to the mid part of the spectrum, as we saw in the Herschel experiment. But stars can get even hotter than the sun. Rigel, the second brightest star in Orion, is at 12,000 degrees Kelvin, which means that it looks a bluish white to our eyes. But stars can get even hotter. White dwarfs, the remnants of dead stars that are so dense, their temperatures can reach over 25,000 Kelvin. At these temperatures, most of their emission occurs beyond the violet and the ultraviolet. In fact, the hottest white dwarf known lies at the core of this nebula, called the Red Spider Nebula. You'll notice that you can't see anything in the middle of the nebula in this photograph. It looks empty. In fact, an extremely luminous object lies at the center, a white dwarf, with an estimated temperature of over 250,000 Kelvin. At these temperatures, most of its emission is in the UV and hard X and X-ray part of the spectrum. An X-ray telescope like XMM or Chandra orbiting above the atmosphere could easily detect the star, but it is nearly invisible to the Hubble Space Telescope that took this image. So, to summarize, as the temperature of stars goes up, the peak wavelength of their emission decreases. This is encapsulated mathematically in Wien's law, which relates the peak wavelength to the temperature of an object. As temperature is in the denominator, as it increases, wavelength must decrease. So as we go from the temperature of Betelgeuse at 3000 degrees Kelvin, the central wavelength is at about 1000 nanometers, so beyond the red part of the spectrum. If we double the temperature to 6,000 degrees Kelvin, the wavelength is reduced by half, and we're at 500 nanometers, the more energetic middle part of the visible spectrum. If we double the temperature again to 12,000 Kelvin, the temperature of Rigel, then the wavelength is halved again, this time to 250 nanometers, or just beyond the violet end of the visible range. So, as the temperature increases, the wavelength decreases. What happens now when the temperature goes down? The peak wavelength must increase, so stars with cooler temperature will emit light at longer wavelengths. We saw this was the case for red Betelgeuse. What happens as the temperature decreases further? Do objects stop emitting light at some point? Imagine you're in a pitch dark room holding a white hot iron poker. As it cools, it'll drop from white hot to red hot to finally just turn dark. It'll become invisible in a dark room because it's not emitting much visible light anymore. But does that mean that it stopped emitting light altogether? No, the light emission is just going to continuously shift into longer and longer wavelengths 
until at some point those wavelengths just aren't visible to our human eyes anymore. At room temperature, say 50 degrees Fahrenheit, all objects emit mostly in the infrared, so beyond wavelengths that the eye can see. The fascinating thing is that this pretty much extends all the way. An ice cube emits wavelengths that are a little bit longer than a sugar cube because it's a little bit colder. Things even colder than frozen water emit even longer wavelengths. If you think back to our discussion of temperature, even at sub-zero temperatures in the Fahrenheit scale, there is still some molecular motion, and f therefore there is still light emission. Thermal emission will only shut off for objects that are so cold that their molecules don't move. That's absolute zero, or zero degrees Kelvin. At that point, there's no thermal emission. What this means is that everything in the universe that has a temperature above absolute zero, and is opaque, remember, has thermal emission, i.e. it emits light. The hotter the object, the shorter the wavelength, and the more light it emits. So let's think back to our infrared camera demo. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of what you're seeing. When we pointed the camera at you, the students, you saw that human beings are the brightest things in the room. That's because we're also the warmest. At 98 degrees Fahrenheit, we're warmer than pretty much everything else except for maybe the glowing lights in the ceiling. The infrared camera we have doesn't have filters like a usual camera, so we don't see color, we just see a grayscale. What happens is that it detects photons in a whole range of infrared wavelengths, but it doesn't discriminate between them, it just sums them together and calculates an intensity of infrared light. Remember, all objects at temperature greater than zero Kelvin emit some form of light, and all objects of temperatures that we commonly encounter, from room, temper room temperature down to zero degrees, down to you know boiling hot water, those objects all emit light in the infrared. We can see this by substituting these temperatures into the Wien's equation here. In Kelvin, the range of temperatures that we usually encounter is between 273 and 320 degrees Kelvin. That translates to a range in wavelengths between 9.6 and 10.2 microns. It's a very small range in wavelength, which means that everything from humans to the tables to the chairs to the floors to the lights emit in the same narrow range, or their peak wavelength is in the same narrow range in the infrared. So, if we're just counting photons, regardless of their wavelength, why do hotter things, like people, come out brighter when we point our cameras at them? The thing to note here is that as the temperature increases, the brightness or the flux of emission increases by a lot. The flux is proportional to temperature to the fourth power. So that means that small variations in temperature between, for example, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 98 degrees Fahrenheit, or 273 and 310 degrees Kelvin, translate into huge differences in flux. We can see that more clearly from this simulator, which shows us the different curves from thermal emission at different temperatures this is for a star, or any material, at 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is close to the temperature of the sun. As you can see, it peaks around 483 nanometers, which is close to the middle of the visible range. If I add a curve here, with a slightly smaller temperature, say 5,000 Kelvin, then you'll see that that curve has not only moved towards the right in wavelength, so that it's now peaking at 579.6 nanometers, but it's also a lot smaller, so that the overall flux from that star, or from that object at 5000 Kelvin, 
is much smaller than the flux that we obtained from the 6,000 Kelvin star. Let's add yet another one at 4,000 Kelvin. And again, the peak moves towards the right, so towards longer wavelengths, and the intensity, or the total flux, goes down. Just for effect, let me show you what the um, emission from a 12,000 Kelvin star looks like. Remember, this is about the temperature of Rigel. If I add this curve, what you'll notice is that not only is the peak at much bluer wavelengths, in fact, well beyond what we can see with our eyes, so at 200 nanometers, but the strength of emission is so much higher. This is the flux from that star, and these are the old curves down here. You can barely see them. So that an increase of a factor of 2 in temperature leads to an increase of 2 to the 4 in flux. 2 to the, to the power of 4 means 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's a factor of 16. So our emission peaks in the infrared. This is the basis for night vision cameras. Us and pretty much everything that surrounds us at so-called room temperature emits in the infrared, as you saw from the demo in class. Hotter things, much hotter things, will emit mostly in the visible, things like your electric stove or the filament in a light bulb. Things that are colder than us emit in longer infrared light, or sometimes even in the radio. This is a picture of our nearby neighbor Andromeda, taken in the long infrared. It was taken by the Herschel Space Telescope, named after William Herschel, the discoverer of infrared radiation. What you're seeing here is light being emitted by all sorts of cool molecular clouds, and um, these regions are very dusty and very cold, and so they emit in much longer wavelengths than what we're usually used to seeing for this galaxy, which is in the upper left corner here. That's what we usually see in the optical or visible wavelengths. And in the upper right is what we see in the infrared. We can combine those two images as a composite and use the infrared to identify the locations of the, in the galaxy where cold clouds might lead to further star formation. This montage also includes an image of the galaxy taken in X-rays. This was not done by the Herschel Space Telescope, but by another telescope. Each one of those points in the X-ray image represents a neutron star or a black hole. These objects are so hot and so energetic that most of their emission comes out in x-rays. At even longer wavelengths than the wavelengths that the Herschel Space Telescope observes, there's a very important astronomical feature. It's called the cosmic microwave background. It's leftover radiation from the explosion of the Big Bang and it's been cooling for 13.7 billion years. That's the age of the universe. The Big Bang was a very energetic event, and this radiation used to be very hot. But it's been cooling continuously since then, and it now has a temperature of only 2.7 degrees Kelvin. That's only a couple of degrees above absolute zero. So it's really very cold indeed. Because it's so cold, the peak of its emission is very is at a very long wavelength at a little bit over 0.1 centimeters this is in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum which is why we call it the cosmic microwave background there will be a lot more on this later in the course so to summarize temperature means 
the average speed of particles or molecules. Particles or molecules in a material have a whole distribution of speed. Some will be very slow, some will be very fast. The average speed of the entire distribution we consider the temperature. In opaque materials, those particles are constantly interacting with light or photons. That interaction between the light and the particles allows the two to reach some sort of equilibrium and that causes thermal emission. Because the temperature is related to the speed of particles, this means that hotter materials will have faster particle motion and therefore will produce more light and that light will be at shorter wavelengths. Hot, colder materials produce less light and that light is emitted at longer wavelengths. The sun has a temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin, and it emits most of its light in the visible regime, with a peak at 500 nanometers. This friendly lemur, on the other hand, has a body temperature of again around 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which comes about to, 100, to about 300 Kelvin. Because his temperature is 300 Kelvin, his wavelength is going to his peak wavelength is going to be much greater and it peaks at around 10,000 nanometers in the infrared. You might notice that these numbers are related. 6,000 kelvins is about 20 times greater than the 300 kelvin of a lemur, and 10,000 nanometers is about 20 times greater than the 500 nanometers of the sun. That's because the two are related by Wien's law. The wavelength and the temperature are inversely related. So that as the temperature goes up by a factor of 20, the wavelength must come down by a factor of 20. Note that there must be a source of energy to make the molecules move in the first place. In the sun, as we'll find out later in this course, in the next module, that source is nuclear fusion. For lemurs and humans, the source is food. We eat food and we extract energy from it, which allows us to keep our molecules vibrating faster than the molecules that surround us in chairs and tables and the ground and all these other things that have sm smaller temperatures. Astronomically, this means that by measuring the amount of light that a star puts out in different wavelengths, sort of like we did with the Herschel experiment, we can locate where the peak is and we can calculate what the star's temperature is. In this case, the emission is peaking at around 483 nanometers and so the temperature is close to 6,000 Kelvin. For this star, the peak has moved a little bit towards the red side, so its temperature must be cooler. It's about 5,000 Kelvin. This star, the peak has further moved, this time into the infrared regime. Its temperature must therefore be cooler, and the temperature is again about 4,000 Kelvin. Think about this. This means that we can measure the temperatures of stars that are trillions of miles away. That's pretty amazing. In the real world, spectra of stars and other astronomical objects aren't usually just simple thermal emission spectra like the ones that I'm showing you here. There are often small features on top of these broad thermal emission peaks. This is a comparison of an idealized solar spectrum based on just thermal emission at 6,000 Kelvin and the actual solar spectrum. Notice that it peaks in the same area and has the same approximate shape. But on top of that smooth emission, there's a bunch of small features, little absorption lines. The origin of these features will be discussed in detail in the next video. This is another way of seeing the same thing. In this case, this is a spectrum of a sun,
and it's depicted as a rainbow of colors going from the deep red to the violet. If the sun's spectrum was just a continuous thermal emission spectrum, you would just see the colors of the rainbow. But superimposed on that thermal emission spectrum are all these dark lines. Each one of these lines has a specific physical origin. And again, we'll discuss where they come from in the next video. I want to leave you with a review question that'll hopefully allow you to test your knowledge that you've gained while watching this video. Below is a spectrum of a familiar astronomical object. Think about these questions, and then in class next time, I'll discuss where the spectrum comes from and what we're looking at.